This week we are uh, looking at the week number two of the life of the Apostle Paul. And last week we, we kind of we saw how, uh, what an angry and violent guy Saul was, that he was not a friend of the movement of Jesus, he was not a friend of the movement of Christianity, uh, quite the contrary actually. This week we're going to take a different uh, angle and we're going to look at uh, some notorious conversions. We're going to look today at the conversion story of the Apostle Paul. It's going to be incredible. Throughout our lives, you can look and see some notorious conversions that have taken place. And when we see it in the headlines, sometimes we don't always believe it. I mean, Justin Bieber coming to Jesus. Kanye West at one point. So it's, I'm not, it's not, no, it's just like, come on. It, like these are, these are decisions in time for people to make in a movement towards Christ. We all stand before God, just like all of us. And, uh, and God will determine the condition of their heart. And so there is a story If how many of you remember Watergate? I'm going to date myself. I'm a poli sci guy. I remember Watergate, Richard Nixon. I am not a crook, all those things. There's a guy who was involved in Watergate by the name of Chuck Colson. Uh, and he was one of the most notorious figures in that event called Watergate, which is historical in our politics and, and one of the greatest scandals in American history. Uh, but Chuck Colson was a guy who it was said that would throw his grandmother under the bus if it meant getting the job done and doing what he had to do. He is a guy who actually went to jail as a result of his involvement in Watergate while in prison. He comes to an encounter with Jesus Christ, and then one of the people who knew him reached out to a senator who is from the other side of the aisle, from the other party, and told him, hey, he wants to talk to you. Would you go and pray for him? And he said, no! <laughs> Are you kidding me? Colson, never! Next day, he called him back, said, you know what? I'm so sorry. I'll go and pray with him. Prayed with him. He confirmed he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. The rest of his life, he told the story of God's great grace over his life. A notorious conversion to faith in Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes when we look at the lives of people, we, we see that we think they might be so far gone that there's no way in, it could ever possibly happen that God could do something in their lives. I think this story, when we talk about notorious conversions, we have to mention, obviously, the most notorious of all, the Apostle Paul. And this morning, we're going to dive into his life, his uh, persecution again of the church, and more importantly, the radical transformation that begins to unfold in his life in a moment in time where God does what we would think is literally the impossible. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. Lord, I pray that you would anoint our ears to hear and our hearts to receive that which you have for each and every one of us today. Lord, we thank you for your word, its power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Men. Now, here's what the Apostle Paul used to, he would, he would refer to himself as the chief of sinners. And this morning, we're going to take Saul at his own words. We're going to look at the testimony of the Apostle Paul standing before King Agrippa and telling the story, recounting the story of how he would persecute the church. And let's take a, a look right now. Saul, in his own words, Acts chapter 22, verses 4 and 5, this is what he said. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death. Now he's standing before people, trying to give an account of his life and how things have changed. He's about to go to prison. He's about to be sent to Rome. Um, to, and so this is the context that we see Paul talking and telling this story. I persecuted the followers of the way to their death arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council uh, can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Acts 26, 9 and 10, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth and that is just what I did in Jerusalem on the authority of the chief priests. I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote 
against them. Galatians 1, 13 and 14, Saul says this, Paul says this, for you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father and of the, the fathers. Listen, Saul's saying, hey, I was a bad man. I was persecuting with violent intent the church of Jesus, this early church movement that was rising in influence and, and mitigating the influence of Judaism at that time and the, and the religious elite of the day. And they were really struggling with what Jesus was doing. They were struggling with what the movement of the apostles were preaching and teaching. And we see Saul as one who's coming in to violently oppose the church. Now that trip to Damascus that he's talking about in Psalm, in, rather in uh, Acts chapter 9, let me go ahead and read it to you. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So here is Saul persecuting the church and he's getting letters to go to Damascus. Now, Damascus was a, a hundred mile trip. It's not just a short distance. It's a hundred miles on foot, in caravan, with people, with, a, uh, with an entourage traveling. That was a long, a, a long journey to just go and persecute the church. And his intent on that trip was to imprison and likely then send to a death sentence those that he found who were following the way of Jesus. Saul had evil intent. His mind, he found perfectly, perfectly reasonable all that he was setting out to do. This is what uh, would have been like the mindset of, the, of Saul the Apostle Paul, then Saul, when he was persecuting the church, he, it would have been something like this. This Jesus of Nazareth is dead. Do you expect me to believe that a crucified nobody is the promised Messiah? According to our law, anybody who is hung on a tree is cursed. Would God take a cursed false prophet and make him the Messiah? No! His followers are preaching that Jesus is both alive and doing miracles through them, but their power comes from Satan, not God. This is a dangerous sect, and I intend to eliminate it before it destroys historic Jewish faith. That would have been the mindset of Saul, who, by the way, was an elite of the elite in his rising in, as a Pharisee, he would have been headed for what would have been the equivalent of like the Supreme Court of the land. He was incredible, brilliant, aggressive, ambitious. He was all of those things. And we see him violently opposed and thinking he is justifiably so in his own mind, his, our ability to rationalize. And we, we, we will see what happens with Saul. We see this a lot in the New Testament when you have encounters with those who are going to entrap Jesus and they were going to arrest Jesus. The only time Jesus allowed himself to, was, to be arrested was the time it was like, hey, this is finished, I'm going to the cross, uh, I'm gonna I'll give myself up. And even in that moment, Peter tried to defend Jesus and he lopped off a guy's ear and Jesus grabbed it and put it back on and healed him. In the moment said, Peter, no, we're not doing it this way, we're just like, I'm gonna go, this is what is gonna happen. And so oftentimes you will see that when those who went to arrest Jesus, they would go with the intent to bring him in to arrest him. But what would happen is that Jesus would actually arrest them by the power and the authority of his spirit. They would go with one intention and they would leave completely different because of the power and the authority of what Jesus did. They didn't arrest Jesus. Jesus arrested their spirit in a way that they came to a knowledge of who he was and walked away different, realizing the authority that Jesus had. And what we're going to see is something very similar. See, Augustine called it this. He said, it's the violent capture of a rebel will. 
this ultimate conversion of Saul set on persecuting the church. And as we saw in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, moving on his way to Damascus in order to further persecute the church. And if he found anyone, his intent was to put them in prison and hopefully with that, a death sentence to follow for their lives. And yet, there comes this moment where it's not Paul doing the arresting, <laughs> but it becomes a moment where Jesus himself arrests Saul on the way to Damascus, it becomes a suddenly moment in the life of Saul. Let's take a look. Acts chapter 9, 3 and 4. And he neared Damascus on his journey. Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Suddenly, 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 in a moment, everything changes. You know, the reality of life is that suddenlies happen every day. We might get a phone call that we weren't expecting. We might go to a doctor's visit and find a diagnosis that we weren't anticipating and suddenly everything shifts and everything changes and we might get a visit at the door in the middle of the night and have the worst case scenario and suddenly everything changes. Life is different the rest of the way. It's a suddenly moment. They happen in our lives all the time. No, 18 years ago, I can't fathom that this is this long ago. Heidi and I lived in Virginia Beach. We were on uh, church staff uh, down there at a great church in Virginia Beach and uh, Jared was two, Jane was three months old in the month of March. I remember this night so vividly because it was a suddenly moment for us. I was sitting at my desk. Jaden was uh, in her crib. Uh, it was somewhere around 7.30 to 8 p.m. And we had just finished our house. We had just decided this would be the house we stay at for our time in Virginia Beach. We had done the roof. We had done the out exterior. We added a playroom in the front. Uh, and because Jaden was just born. We would take usually from seven to eight and play with Jared in that playroom uh, real consistently. It was like the pattern. We put Jaden down. We'd play in the playroom together as a family. And on that particular night, because March is my birthday month, just FYI, uh, <laughs> Heidi and Jared were out buying a, a present for me and looking to, to buy a present. Well, I'm sitting at my desk and Jaden is already down and the next thing I hear this pop, 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 pop. And I look up and I thought, man, that sounded really close. And it didn't sound like a firecracker so much. And I look in our kitchen and there's all this drywall dust flying in the air and like smoke flying through the kitchen and flying into the, into the area. And I realized, oh, this, this was not good. <laughs> this was a shooting. This was not a firecracker thing. And someone had fired a nine millimeter into our home. And I'm sitting there, I go run and I grab the, the phone. I called the police, never called 911 in my life. I called 911 in that moment. I went back and checked on Jade and made sure she was okay. Uh, the police came and, and they had determined that, that there was a, a kid who was being chased and ran in front of our house and just happened to be in front of our house. And nine bullets from a nine millimeter came into our home, into my car. As a matter of fact, I had this great Mitsubishi Gallant. And in the passenger seat of the Mitsubishi Gallant, there was a, there was a bullet hole in the headrest that was right there. It's pretty awesome. And all, I mean, the, this incredible stuff. A suddenly moment. And so we called our pastor and said, hey, Pastor Steve, this, this was the craziest thing. Uh, Heidi called our friends. And so we're like, all right, we just need to let the kids be with them for maybe a little bit. And um, we'll just see what's going down. So we called and said, well, you guys got to get out of there tonight. And we talked to the police and like, hey, what do you guys do? And I'm like, well, we're pastors. Do you have any enemies? I'm like, I don't know, the devil. <laughs> I'm not sure. And so they leave and would, they, didn't, you know, they didn't really know yet exactly what had taken place. And it was just kind of this crazy moment. And so we're packing up to go to the hotel down at the oceanfront and just get away for the night. And, and I remember Heidi's on the phone in that room 
that we normally, by the way, would have been playing with Jared the same time that the bullets came flying through that room. By the providence and by the grace of God, we weren't in that room together. And later that night, we're, we're packing, and Heidi's talking to her mom. This is probably within a two-hour window of after the police have, have left. I hear this scream, and it's Heidi. And I thought, that's not good. What could that possibly be? Well, Heidi's on the phone talking to her mom and standing in our backyard looking into the room that was just shot at is a person on the other side of the window staring at her and she's staring back at him and screams. And I thought, oh my God, this is not good. So she runs back to me and we get the kids, we put them in the bathroom. And this is a suddenly moment. And, and in that moment, I thought, what am I going to do? And I grabbed my shotgun and I got it ready. And I thought, waiting, because in those moments, it's like, if you're going to do that, you got to know you're willing to actually do it. So if you're going to pull that out, it's got to be a moment of like, okay. And I just remember sitting there in my house, waiting for the glass to break, waiting for someone to come in and, and uh, you know, that had probably already been a part of, of shooting our home. And it was just this incredibly crazy, suddenly moment in a home that we had just determined to be the final home that we were in in Virginia Beach and this suddenly moment changed everything. I remember the next day we were meeting with Pastor Steve. Um, long story short, they ended up finding the person who was looking in our house. They charged him with just looking. They didn't say it was, they tried to tell me it was an unrelated event and I'm like, listen man, I, I've never called 911 in my life. Tonight I've called 911 twice I don't know. I mean, just maybe it's related. Just, just a thought. But neither here nor there in that. But we met with Pastor Steve the next day, who was our pastor, and he just he looked at us and in such a firm, commanding, and authoritative way, just said, "Listen, guys, two things: renew your mind and don't let this touch your spirit." And it, it taught us something that in those suddenly moments we have to really lean on the sovereignty of God. We have to lean in trusting who he is when the suddenly comes, when the diagnosis comes, when the event comes. We've got to lean into the sovereignty of who he is and understand he is still in control and God still cares. And I think this is the lesson that, that Saul learned in a kind of unique way. It's not the suddenly that I'm talking about, but it was a suddenly moment where it was clear that the sovereignty of God was greater than Paul's desire to hammer the church. If we look in Psalm 139, 12, it says this, we cannot hide from the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-encompassing God. And listen, friends, Saul learned that lesson on that road to Damascus in a suddenly moment. And I don't know what your moment may be, but I want you to take courage in the fact that God knows you, that God loves you, that God is for you. God knows and he is aware and in this moment, right now, God wants to speak the hope of heaven over your life, the peace of heaven over your life, the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-encompassing God is sovereign. He knows and he cares for you in this moment. And when we look, I think, at the, the life of, of uh, Saul, we can look at this moment and think, man, that was just like this one thing, this divine encounter that changed everything. And that was the only bit of the story that matters. This one moment that God did the miraculous in the life of Saul. And we can, we can be drawn into the suddenly moment in such a way that we think that there's nothing that precedes it. But I think when we take a look further at this story, we'll see something that we'll see in our own lives and that we'll see in the lives of other people as well. I call them the seeds of suddenly. And in this one moment, there's an encounter that Saul has that transforms his life from the vicious and violent persecutor of the church that we know to becoming and unfolding to become the great apostle Paul, the builder of the church that we truly know. And we might look at that and say it was just this one divine moment. But I think a closer look would tell us that there were seeds of suddenly along the way, goadings by God to Paul 
to let him know, hey, I'm real. And Paul, you are, Saul, you are wrong. This is what Saul says in Acts 26, 14, and he's giving the account to Agrippa, and this is what he says, Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, we don't normally know what that phrase, kick against the goads, means in our modern vernacular and Western culture. However, in the culture Latin and Greek and Hebrew, they would have fully understood what it means to kick against the goads. It was an agrarian term. It was a term that was used with oxen and driving oxen. And the oxen would be, the, they would use the goad to, to prod and push the oxen forward. I think it looks a little bit, I think we have a picture of what a goad, some, look a little bit something like that with a pointy thing in the end. And they would prod and, and, and poke and push and goad the oxen forward. And Jesus is saying to Paul, Paul, you're kicking against the goads and it's not beneficial. You've kicked against the goads. And when they would kick against the goad, what would happen is they would actually injure their flesh and push them even further in a direction they probably didn't want to go because the goad was pushing them. I think what Jesus was saying is I've been goading you, Paul. (laughs) And this is the moment everything changes. This is the moment the seeds of suddenly blossoms in full bloom. But there were moments of seeding and goading along the way. And we might ask, what are some of those moments? Because I think when we look at our own life and our own relationship with Jesus and the relationship other people may have, and this is why we need to have hope no matter what we think somebody's condition is before God. Because we don't know all the seeds that have been planted along their path. Here's one of the seeds, the life of Jesus himself. I mean, Paul would have been a contemporary, Saul then known as Saul, would have been a contemporary of Jesus around the same age, certainly as a Pharisee and a religious zealot, he would have known all the teachings of Jesus. I could see Saul creeping into his synagogue, listening to Jesus, thinking, what is going on? This guy, how is he gaining notoriety? What's going on with him? Leaving angry, frustrated, the very life and teaching of Jesus himself walking in the same cities, around the same circles, would have been a goading to Saul, a preparation for Saul to realize eventually who Jesus truly was and what he came to accomplish. I think another goading of Saul would have been when Gamaliel stood at the council. We talked about this last week at the Sanhedrin and the apostles were there and they were being accused and they were being threatened perhaps for their very lives. And Gamaliel stands up and I imagine Saul in the moment is like, what are are you doing? Here's my hero and my mentor and my rabbi and one I've spent my life trying to become like and to learn how to think like and to orate like and to argue like and to interpret the law like. And here he is standing up defending these blasphemers. How disillusioning it probably was for Saul in that moment to think, what, Gamaliel, what are you doing? Just let him die. But if you were, remember the words of Gamaliel, I'll read them to you from Max chapter five, it says this, it says, when they heard this, they were furious and they wanted to put them to death. But the Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves, listen to this, fighting against God. And I just have to think that in that moment where Jesus appears to Saul on the road to Damascus and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? There's probably a flashback of a memory standing before the Sanhedrin, watching Gamaliel give this word. Hey guys, listen, with this group, you better be careful because if it's of man, it's gonna fail. But if it's of God, you might find yourselves fighting against God. And in that moment when Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
I can hear the echo of, you will be fighting against God. It's a seed of suddenly. Gamaliel's response at the council, Saul's response, I'm sure, to Gamaliel's defense of the apostles, a moment in time that God uses in preparation to do what he wants to do in our lives. The third goading, the third seed of suddenly would be the peaceful death of Stephen. If you remember, Saul was there standing at the feet collecting the coats of those who would stone Stephen, who would martyr him, who would murder him on the spot, who would stone him to death. And it wouldn't have been that Stephen was put to death that haunted Saul. Now, it wouldn't have been the fact that he was hunted down and stoned to death. Now, it would have been the way that he died that would have haunted Saul. Because Stephen, in that moment, he's not crying out for mercy. He's not begging them to stop. He's not recanting that, that he loves Jesus and he's a follower of Christ. Quite the opposite. None of that happened. He was at peace. As the stones began to come, he's at peace. As his body begins to get broken, he's at peace. As his flesh begins to tear, he's at peace. That's what would have haunted Saul. How is this man getting stoned to death with our violent approval watching. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that Stephen's face shone like that of an angel. And the haunting words of Stephen that the Apostle Paul would have remembered before this beautiful day on Damascus, when Stephen is getting stoned to death, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Sound familiar? And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father and he had peace and he... That's what would have haunted Saul. And I think we have to wonder, even on this 100 mile journey, in those moments of solitude, in those moments of quiet, in those moments of thinking through life and the situations that he's faced. There had to be moments when he saw Stephen's face shining like that of an angel. There had to be moments when Saul saw, saw Stephen's face and he heard Stephen's voice saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It was a goading. And in the quiet moments of life, perhaps even on this road to Damascus itself. Stephen was speaking to Saul and God was speaking to Saul via what he had encountered in that very first martyr. And the final goading I believe would be this, just the courage of the Christians that Saul was persecuting. Sure, some would have fainted, some would have fallen back, but by and large, so many would have just said boldly, take us, knowing most likely it was a death sentence. Why would these people go? Why don't they fight? Why don't they just say Jesus isn't real and what God, why, why, why? So I think sometimes we believe that it's a suddenly moment that has nothing attached to it. But the reality for every story in here, there are moments that happen before you ever made a decision for Jesus. Conversations, prayers that were prayed, encounters that happened that maybe you didn't think a whole lot of or things that you witnessed and watched in the lives of other people. Things that took place in the lives of those you're believing for things that took place in your life before you came to that moment of praying and inviting Jesus to be the Lord of your life. We can't discount any of that. And I want to encourage us. That's why when you see the person you think is so, so far away from God, you have no idea of the seeds of suddenly that God has planted in their life. 
and just think it maybe it would be your invitation or your conversation or your prayer or your kindness or your grace that could be the very thing that blossoms that seed and in a moment what a privilege so don't take for granted the hundredth invitation you've given to someone it's Easter don't take for granted the opportunity to invite someone into a relationship with Jesus don't take for granted the prayers that you are praying and the, the seeds that we are sowing for the, the people who are on your floor. Don't take for granted all these moments. Why? Because they are seeds of what God wants to suddenly do in the life of that person. Where there is a miraculous conversion of grace and hope and peace that infiltrates their life. You know, there's a great story of a young guy that I know from our days at serving on church team and it was Easter and this young guy got an invitation from someone who is the most prolific inviter and bringer to church that I have ever known one of the greatest soul winners I've ever met would invite and talk and have conversations with people and she invited this young man to church and on that Easter Sunday morning he made a decision for Jesus and out of that decision on that Easter Sunday morning, he got connected into the young adult ministry. Eventually he attended the Bible college. From the Bible college, he started an internship at the church. And then he started uh, working in the ministry, transportation, busing people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people to church and to youth. And then he met his wife and he got married. And then they've had kids. And this story of how God builds a life. And where did it begin? It began with someone having the courage to invite him to church on Easter. And in that service, he makes a decision, a decision that changes his life and the life of his family and the life of his kids for the generations to come. It's a suddenly moment built on seeds of suddenly. How many times had he had been invited to church? I don't know. How many prayers had his grandmother mother prayed for him? I know a lot. Listen, guys, we are in a season of sowing and sowing and sowing and preparing and believing and knowing that God can do it suddenly. But it's not just the divine moment. There are seeds that are planted along the way. There's preparation of the heart. And I wanna encourage you today. Well, let's be thinking and praying. Let's keep praying for the four that you've listed. Let's keep standing in faith. Don't get discouraged when you get a no. Don't get discouraged when someone feels so far away from God. That, that son or that daughter you've been praying for, keep praying, keep believing, keep sowing seeds of faith, keep praying that people would come into their life with a conversation at the right time in the right moment. You never know how that suddenly is going to unfold into something beautiful. And here I know that this morning, looking across this room and certainly online, the question is, do you know Jesus? Do you know what it is to have a life-giving relationship with him? Do you know what it is to be forgiven of your sin? Do you know what it is to, to know that Jesus loves you, that he cares for you, that God is all-knowing, all-seeing, all-encompassing, and he cares about your life. He knows everything about you. He cares about who you are, about what you're facing, what you're navigating. Do you know Jesus? Have you experienced a suddenly moment, a moment where you go, okay, I realize today I need his grace. I realize today in this moment, I need the hope that only heaven can bring. And this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm talking to you. Do you know Jesus? And if you would say today, Jason, honestly, before God, maybe I once served him, I once knew him, but right now I'm not actively living a life that is honoring Jesus. I'm not actively pursuing him. 
Listen, no shame, no condemnation. Here's what I know. I know that God loves you, that God is for you, and he's prepared you for this moment. Along the way, in conversations, he's prepared you for a life-defining decision of saying, God, I'm gonna follow you wholeheartedly with all of me. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you today, and you say, Jason, I know that today I need to invite Jesus to be the Lord of my life. For those watching online as well, if that's you, come on, without shame, without reservation, without hesitation, God's speaking, he's calling you into relationship. If that's you today, I'm gonna ask you to do something in just a moment, not gonna embarrass you in any way. But if you know that you need Jesus, I'm gonna ask you to slip your hand up high enough and long enough for me to see it. And just to say, God, I, I want Jesus. I need Jesus in my life. I need his grace. I need his forgiveness. If that's you today, without hesitation, just slip up your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. I see a person right here. Thank you so much. And another person there. Thank you so much. And another person right here. Thank you so much. Is it others today who say, yep, yeah, I need Jesus. Come on, without shame, without hesitation. God loves you. God's for you. God desires relationship with you. Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray a prayer of just receiving Christ. And I'm gonna invite all of us to pray this prayer together. If you're watching online and you made that decision, I wanna encourage you. There's a button that you can click that said, I made a decision. I want you to pray this prayer right where you see it, at home with us right now to pray this prayer of inviting Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, I invite you right now to be the Lord of my life. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for your unconditional love. Thank you for the seeds of suddenly in my life. And today, I commit to you without reservation, without hesitation, I will follow you all the days of my life. I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, and you are my Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Come on, let's give God a great big round of applause for those 